Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Fakri Kare, and uh, I am the provost at uh, Mohammed bin Zayed University of AI. And uh, I would like to uh, share with you a few insights today on um, uh, one aspect of artificial intelligence, which hasn't seen uh, I mean, its fair share in terms of uh, analysis and uh, presentation in uh, many uh, instances related to uh, artificial intelligence. So I would like to give some insight. So this uh, presentation is not going to be uh, theoretically in nature. So it's a set of uh, insights that I would like to share with you. Uh, publications of most of the work that I have done and you can find it throughout these slides is in the last part of uh, the slides. You can also check on the Google Scholar for the past few years and you see some of the work that is showing in these slides. So um, let me uh, mention this, uh, the outline here. So uh, I would like to speak about uh, the landscape of uh, operation artificial intelligence and its economic impacts, uh, overview on operation artificial intelligence and machine learning, uh, major impact of operational AI on society, uh, operational AI in the academic industrial context. And then I will conclude with some re remarks in terms of uh, advancement and in terms of challenges of utilizing AI. So uh, there are several definitions of AI. You have seen many, many of them. So I'm not going to duplicate them, but one of the, I mean, uh, the most used one, which is the Merriam-Webster dictionary and it's uh, generic. I mean, it could be understood by uh, all uh, layers of people who have interest in the field of AI from, uh, uh, I mean, uh, knowledgeable to the people who have first uh, heard about AI. So it's the capability of a machine and the machine is defined here. It could be a software, it could be a hardware, it could be an integrated system that involves both, both software and hardware to imitate intelligent human behavior. And the intelligent human behavior is noted here in terms of uh, perception, in terms of recognition, in terms of uh, uh, th things that uh, human do in day-to-day -day life when interacting with each other or when interacting with uh, particular objects. And these are the type of tools that people have been using and developing in uh, the field of artificial intelligence. There is another uh, definition, which is a little bit more uh, technically uh, oriented, and uh, it is a branch of computer science that focuses on building and managing technology that can learn to autonomously make decisions and carry out actions on behalf of a human being. So this is a uh, uh, definition uh, found in Techopedia. Uh, there is another, I mean, very generic uh, definition, but I'm not going to go over it. Uh, but I would like to define here what is the meaning of operational AI, which I am tackling in this particular presentation. So operational AI is simply the applied aspect of artificial intelligence for use in world application. So basically this is the implementation of AI tools and machine learning tools, as we are going to see uh, that machine learning is a subset of AI and uh, how to apply them in real world application in various applications around us, whether robotics, whether telemedicine, whether decision support system, whether in banking, language, uh, speech, understanding, all of these type of application, when we are utilizing a tool in AI, we call it operational AI versus fundamental AI or also foundational AI which is basically building sophisticated algorithms that are anchored in deep mathematical formalism. So this is the other component. So we have operational AI and the fundamental AI, and I'm going to differentiate between both of them today. Augmented AI is another definition that people also have been using. I mean, and it is simply the empowerment of a human intelligence using new tools of technology, AI and machine learning. So it makes use of a mix of fundamental AI and operational AI. One particular example of augmented AI is when we are uh, using um, the virtual assistants, uh, whether on our mobile system or on our computer system. So basically it's the human interacting with the machine and the machine utilizing the cloud services is able to interact with us using AI tools. So this particular aspect, I mean, where the human is connected to the machine is called augmented AI. So basically it links, it bridges to the human being. The other definition, which also 
a lot of people have spoken about and uh, which is basically the ultimate goal of what a number of scientists would like to reach is the hypothetical ability of an intelligent agent to understand or, or learn any intellectual task that a human being can. So basically this is mimicking the behavior of a human as almost a human. And for many scientists, for many researchers, this is not the ultimate goal of what AI scientists would like to reach. There is some uh, possibilities for accessing the highest level of AI, but artificial general intelligence, I mean, reaching the level of the human reasoning, reaching the level of a human perception uh, of the human cognitive abilities is a goal that uh, a lot of scientists, first of all, they know that it is extremely challenging. Uh, secondly, they know that it's uh, something that is not required at this particular stage. We would like a machine, we would like a system that help us out in everyday life. So the utopia of AI and what uh, a lot of people would like to, uh, to do is to use the human reasoning as a guide to build systems that provide better services or create better production. Uh, products. So basically, we would like to utilize uh, how the human being is uh, perceiving things. I mean, not necessarily with our sensory type of system of the human or with our brain capabilities, but something that is similar. So we would like to mimic the behavior of the human in achieving certain type of task. So the goal is not achieving a perfect replica of the human mind. We would like to uh, create something that mimic the human intelligence in achieving certain set of goals. So um, AI for social good is another uh, aspect of AI and uh, which is one of the most noble aspects of uh, AI where uh, we would like to use the tool of artificial intelligence to enhance uh, our world and benefit the well-being of the humanity in general. And AI for social good is uh, very, very uh, utilized and it's very well developed in a wide range of area. And uh, a lot of companies that have been, uh, I mean, accused of using AI for uh, uh, not so uh, uh, humanistic type of goals now are trying to uh, complement the usage of AI in their companies uh, and they call it AI for social good to help the humanity and uh, to show people that uh, AI could be utilized for the better of humanity. Now, the, this is, I mean, a uh, remark that uh, I would like to make uh, here, which basically gives us the background why we would like to utilize operational AI. So only 10% of the machine learning algorithms developed so far are being used in real world applications. 10% only. So we are spending, I mean, tens of billions of dollars in research work, I mean, whether in institutions, whether in companies, whether in corporation to uh, develop, I mean, very powerful machine learning or AI algorithms. And only 10% or even less than 10% are being used in real world application. So uh, there is a vast, uh, I mean, um, distance between what we develop and what we end up using. And this is a problem because we are uh, trying to uh, develop, I mean, centers, we are trying to develop, I mean, we are trying to educate uh, experts on utilizing tools of AI and still, I mean, only 10% of these type of tools are being utilized. So uh, the major problem is coming from the fact that the academic context, which is the long-term development, which is uh, based on research, and the industrial context, which is basically taking product and commercializing them, uh, are uh, the industrial context would like to have the fast return on investments. They would like to have system that do work and they are easily usable by human. So these two type of objectives or context are in a lot of times, not some time in, in conflicts. So that's why operational AI has come to bridge this gap between the academic context of AI and the industrial context of usage of AI. And that's what I would like to express in this uh, presentation. So let me uh, provide here uh, uh, machine uh, learning landscape, AI machine learning landscape. So this is screenshots at a particular day for the activity of Google uh, machine learning platform TensorFlow around the world. So uh, the darker the spots, 
the more usage of the TensorFlow platform in that particular uh, location. So you can see it it's spread out all over the world with North America, uh, Southeast Asia, and uh, Europe have, I mean, the line pa lines part of uh, the usage of um, this particular platform. So TensorFlow, for those who are not familiar with TensorFlow, it's a platform for machine learning that Google has uh, developed and uh, it's basically a library that people use it for uh, machine learning development uh, tools. Uh, if we look at uh, the, the field of AI and what is doing now, I would like to compare it with a number of industrial revolutions that have occurred uh, over I mean, the past two centuries. So we have the first industrial revolution, which used uh, mostly the tools of water and the steam power to mechanize production. We have the second industrial revolution, which has used uh, electric power for mass production in the early part of the 20th century. And then the third industrial revolution, which is basically the automation production. Uh, and they have used electronics and information technology to create uh, words with uh, quite a bit, I mean, with uh, quite a bit of automation, manufacturing and intelligent systems over the past uh, 40 years. And now we are coming to another type of revolution, which is what a lot of people are calling fourth industrial revolution. And this industrial revolution happens uh, at the joining of a number of breakthroughs of enabling technologies, I mean, including robotics, uh, nanotechnologies, 5G, and in the very near future, 6G, Internet of Things, computer vision, natural language understanding. And all of these type of breakthroughs that have seen the day over the past uh, decade or 15 years, they have seen a huge uh, improvement and the huge developments, and uh, mostly is due to the uh data analytics and uh, the effect of ai and machine learning on these type of breakthroughs without ai and machine learning it is almost impossible to uh, see this type of uh, revolutionary type of technologies uh, strive uh, nowadays whether in uh, autonomous driving whether in uh, intelligent banking whether in virtual healthcare system almost ai you find it i mean almost everywhere and there will come a uh, few moments when I'm going to speak about the AI and machine learning and how they are related still for uh, the layman uh, presentation uh, level. As I mentioned to you, the context of this presentation is the higher level presentation on uh, operational AI and its usage for uh, nowadays in, in society. So uh, when we say that AI is transforming the world and uh, this has been happening only recently, almost in the past 10 years, 12 years. This is, I mean, very short time frame when we see the impact that AI and machine learning have had on uh, businesses, on industry and society. It, is, it, is, it has been incredible. No one could have imagined, I mean, only uh, 12 years ago, 15 years ago, that uh, a revolution is occurring right now because of uh, major advances that have happened in the field of machine learning, deep learning, and AI. And I'm going to uh, differentiate a little bit between the, these particular terms. So if we look at uh, the econo uh, economic impact on uh, machine learning and AI, uh, by 2030, uh, it says that uh, the GDP of the world is going to grow by uh, up to 14%, which is around 15.7 trillion to the global GDP. So uh, the global GDP is around, uh, around $100 trillion a year, and uh, we are going to see it grow by $15.7 trillion uh, as only the component of AI as its impact on the economic development in various sector of the society, in almost every sector of the industry, every sector of the society. And this is unthinkable five to six years ago. I mean, in past years, when you say that the particular technology or particular uh, novelty is contributing to a few billion dollars of uh, impact on GDP is something uh, big. Now we are looking at 15.7 trillion and 2030 is not far away from, from now. 
so if you look at the value forecast by AI type, so here we see decision support system, agents, decision automation, smart products. So this is the distribution. As you can see, the decision support augmentation system is among the highest uh, level of usage uh, in uh, millions of dollars. So the uh, left hand side in millions of dollars. So it's almost 44% of the total uh, business value forecast. And this is huge. This is huge. So the smart product, as you can see, also is increasing. Uh, I mean, from year to year to year. And uh, these smart products are going to contribute to uh, a lot of things. I mean, from uh, Internet of Things to smart driving to uh, smart grid, all of these type of things are related to smart products. Reason for the hugely growing role of AI is the tremendous opportunity for economic development. So this is the slide that I just uh, mentioned here. And uh, I'll go to the next slide, which says that the big data and machine learning are fueling the huge growth in major innovative breakthroughs in various fields. So we can see in this um, diagram, the smart uh, robotics, internet of things, autonomous vehicles, 3D printing, 5G networks, uh, biotechnology, material science, energy storage, smart grid, fintech. So possibly 10, 12 years ago, we don't see these type of areas, I mean, as being impacted this much by AI and machine learning. But nowadays, we see them heavily, heavily impacted by these type of tools. And going back to the subject of our presentation, these are tools that we are implementing to this particular type of industry, to this particle of technologies and their application to these particular technologies account for only 10% of all machine learning tools that have been developed, I mean, for almost the past 20 years or 30 years. So we see the impact that uh, these type of tools are having on the various aspects of technology. So you can see almost every industry is touched. I mean, shipping industry, transportation, healthcare, uh, uh, driving systems, uh, traffic control, almost every area uh, is, uh, every aspect is now affected by artificial intelligence uh, tools and machine learning systems, which we are going to uh, define in few few moments. So the huge growth in AI and its usage is due to a technological perfect storm that has occurred only the past 10 years. The first one is the powerful computing processors and the huge storage facilities. The second one is the tremendous amount of data that have become available to the masses. Uh, it used to be only available to large companies or to wealthy uh, enterprises, but now it's, I mean, available everywhere. So even a startup company without a lot of funding is able to utilize a large amount of data to, to, to do predictive analytics or to utilize tools of AI and machine learning. And then the third one, development of powerful and scalable algorithms. These algorithms that are, I mean, creating, generating this uh, perfect storm have been developed 20, 25 years ago. I'm coming to the history of these type of algorithms, but they haven't been able to impact the society, to impact the industry, because these type of algorithms were extremely difficult to implement into powerful uh, computer systems, which make them functional and which make them operational, I mean, within almost real time type of applications. The origins of things, so I won't go, uh, I will go quite uh, fast here, but it is, I mean, something that is very important to know. So the origin, I mean, it's a mix of things that have happened since the 1940s with the sequential computing that has been, I mean, uh, developed first by uh, von Neumann. I mean, the first uh, computer that we know today, the sequential computer, the classical computer system has seen its first day in the early 1940s. And this is of course related to the history of the Second World uh, War II, where they wanted to develop algorithms to make use of these type of algorithms and uh, these type of computing systems for, I mean, to utilize it for uh, the war ends. And then 1950 and 1970, 1950 and 1960, so two major things. The first one was, I mean, uh, Frank Rosenblatt, I mean, uh, discovery of the original perceptron system, which is, I mean, the precursor 
of what we are seeing today of the uh, huge neural network that we are seeing today. So in the 1955, 1956, Rosenblatt came up with the original perceptron system that uh, has made the revolution that we are seeing nowadays. Also during the same period, 1950, 1970, uh, John McCarthy came up with the LISP program, which is an expert system based type of programming language that has seen, I mean, uh, major impacts in the area of artificial intelligence and AI was coined around that period of time by researchers such as uh, John McCarthy and, uh, and others. And then we have the modern AI deep learning system, which is basically the rebirth of a uh, new network system or machine learning based on connectionist modeling that has occurred since the early 1990s and in the early 2000s. Uh, Shmiduba is one of them, uh, Jeffrey Hinton is another one, Yushua Bingio, uh, Lukun are among pioneers who have developed their earliest deep learning models in 1991, 1992, in the earliest paper. And then when things started to transform in terms of computational resources, their algorithms have become made, made sense for to be, uh, to be utilized. And that's what we are seeing the revolution nowadays in the area of deep learning. Uh, this is another slides that uh, I took uh, from a colleague of mine, uh, who is the editor of the journal. So let me uh, see this one here. Okay, so this is a diagram that I took it from the golden age of AI, which is uh, uh, in the area of discovery of artificial intelligence, which was just published, I mean, a few, few days ago, and he used this uh, particular uh, diagram, and the title of the article is The Golden Edge of AI, an excellent article summarizing the developments, I mean, from the 1940s to uh, 2020, 2021. And you can see the revolution, as I mentioned to you, from 1940 to 1960 to 1970. And then there is what is known as the AI winter, because these early perceptron system have not, I mean, provided the promise that a lot of people have thought to replace the sequential computer and uh, to, to utilize the neural network systems. And then the rebirth in the mid 80s by uh, Jeff Hinton and uh, Rumel Hart using the, uh, the back propagation learning algorithms. A lot of progresses have been made from 1980 to 1990. And uh, uh, during that period of time, Japan's uh, fifth general computer system has been uh, made, the driverless car system, the first one was designed in 1986, is very rudimentary type of system. And of course, the back propagation learning algorithm in 1986. And then there is the second AI winter where people did not believe that these type of systems are going to be indeed deployed in the technology because neural network systems, why it has generalized beyond the perceptron, it couldn't be used in real world system or real world type of application. And only in the early 2000s, when system become a little bit more powerful, that people started, I mean, seeing the uh, involvement of these type of algorithms with the uh, appearance of very powerful type of computer, even for researchers, I mean, individual type of researchers in 2005, 2006, I mean, the clouds that started to appear uh, and people started to uh, store a lot of data in the cloud and make use of computational resources of the cloud. And starting 2010, the revolution really started there, out there, because of benchmark type of uh, achievements that have occurred uh, using, I mean, the implementation and the recognition for, um, for the image, I mean, from the ImageNet uh, uh, data repository, which has, I mean, reached the level of recognition of almost a human in 2010 and 2011, not only in terms of image recognition, but also in terms of signal uh, recognition, namely speech recognitions. At the time, the accuracy was around 60 to 62% for the best systems, a benchmark system that has achieved by, uh, by Jeff Hinton and his students in 2010, 2011. 
Uh, I remember it very well because I was uh, visiting the University of Toronto at the time, and they invited a number of colleagues who used to work in the research lab at University of Toronto to give some uh, presentation at University of Waterloo in the area of speech recognition. And at that time, they were telling us before they published their work that they have re reached level of accuracy up to 80, 82% which is a major benchmark in the area of speech recognition. And the story continued since then without stopping. And we are seeing nowadays a major, major uh, application of these type of systems. I mean, from the DeepMind AlphaGo in 2016 to the CMU Liberty system to a lot of applications and uh, to the latest one in 2021, uh, only a few days ago that uh, DeepMind uh, are claiming to have uh, developed a system, a reinforcement learning system based on deep learning architecture that mimics in a certain way an early stage of artificial general uh, intelligence. I will mention that a little bit shortly. So that's basically the evolution of what happens. But let me give, I mean, for those who are not very much familiar, I mean, very, very, uh, I mean, well-known area that uh, artificial intelligence is the umbrella that covers among others tools such as machine learning. I mean, AI is an umbrella of technologies that have been developed, some of which has been connectionist based and some of which have been st uh, stochastic based and machine learning models uh, that are able to discover data using, I mean, certain type of algorithms for prediction and classification is a subset of artificial intelligence. Uh, deep learning is itself a subset of machine learning algorithms. It is a special type of machine learning algorithms that have a certain hierarchical and multi-layered data representation system. So we can see that AI includes machine learning, which in turn includes deep learning. This is very, very, I mean, uh, highest level of description. Things are a little bit more, uh, I mean, uh, complex than that. So you can see in this particular picture, which I took it from uh, the net, and it shows the evolution from artificial intelligence early days to machine learning, I mean, in the 1980s and to the deep learning. So starting the 1980s, artificial intelligence have become almost connectionist based rather than rule based, similar to the expert system, which have flourished in the 70s and the 80s. But the connectionist models have taken over in the 80s, 90s and the 2000s up to this day in the area of deep learning system. <clears throat> Excuse me. So uh, approximate, so this is uh, approximate relationship uh, linking the various area of AI, machine learning, big data. So this is a picture that illustrates each area and uh, how it is overlapping with other areas. So you can see data, big data, predictive analytics. You can see deep learning, the little ball there that is basically a tool that is using the fuel of big data and uh, data system to provide predictive analytics type of outcome. The statistical tools also are being used for big data and for data to uh, provide us decision. Cognitive computing, natural language processing, artificial intelligence in general, I mean, which is the umbrella of all these type of tool. So we can see that all of them are overlapping within certain type of context. So the area of artificial intelligence, deep learning, natural language processing are entangled with each other and we cannot separate their connections, uh, especially nowadays. So this is, I mean, the area of operational AI that uh, I just spoke about. And uh, uh, operational AI is using tool to make systems scalable, uh, tools to make system transparent, tool to make system dependable, tools of AI to make system accessible, secure, and compact. Why we are doing that? In order to make these type of tools used by industry and by the, I mean, by the businesses in order to propagate them to the end users, which is the society. So that's why we call them operational AI. System have to be this way. They have to be scalable. They have to be transparent for people to make use of them. They have to be dependable. However, in the lab, you can develop a large number of tools that are not necessarily able to uh, provide these answers. So we know that probabilistic models, uh, intelligent agents, game theory, optimization and decision-making, data science and analytics 
are algorithms that have been developed in the lab. A number of them haven't been uh, used in the operational type of AI systems. And the uh, effort is to import foundational AI or fundamental AI from the research lab to the society. And that has been uh, the goal of many institutions around the world, especially nowadays. So major class of machine learning, I'm not going to dwell on this one. So this is, I mean, a diagram that is very well known for, for people. So there are uh, the machine learning system, I mean, uh, the supervised and supervised and the reinforcement, the semi-supervised when the data has part labeled, has part and labeled system. So one of them is task driven, others are data driven and the reinforcement, which is seeing a lot, lot of growth in recent year is environment driven. Driven. Why? Because it mimics in certain way the perception capabilities of a human. So if we are developing a reinforcement agent that has capability of perception of sensing around itself and the learning capability of the system using reinforcement uh, uh, algorithm that mimics in most of the cases the human capabilities. And this is one of the ways where we would like to mimic the human abilities in recognizing things or in nav navigating around things and being cognizant of their context and their surrounding. So uh, artificial neural network, a number of you are familiar with these type of uh, pictures. So I picked up this picture. So in the upper parts, how we train the system. So basically we present a number of objects here, a number of different animals, and then we propagate them through layers of neurons. And then our system would say that whether the object is true or not, and the error, whether it's true or false, is being propagated layer by layer until it reaches the first layer of the system. And during that propagation, back propagation, the system improves the weights that are the connections between these value of the uh, neurons of the neural network. And the system keeps training, keeps training until the systems become, uh, I mean, almost recognizable and uh, until the error becomes extremely low, then the system is not training anymore. And then it is going to be deployed. Once the system is deployed, usually the system is commercialized or is productized. But a lot, of the, uh, a lot of the times, this is not as easy as we might think. And those who have used neural network system know that there are a lot of issues I mean, in neural network systems, especially deep ones with many, many layers. Now, the difference between machine learning and deep learning, I took this diagram as well from a website, and I found it to be one of the most I mean, uh, explicit diagrams. So when we see the machine learning in the upper part, uh, so by the way, this one is taken from the same uh, image as this uh, mapper.com. So uh, machine learning is where you have an input, you have manual feature extraction, we say manual, I mean, it could be using particular type of tool, and then you have classification neural network system to provide the outputs. For the deep learning system, you have a system that is deeper than this one in the machine learning, and the feature extraction capability is embedded in the neural network itself, and the system has a certain type of functionalities in its various type of layers, allowing it to extract the feature in an autonomous way. So without the help of a human or manual type of extraction, which we, when we say manual, it's using tools that are not necessarily connectionist based type of systems. So that's the major difference between machine learning and deep learning. So deep learning is a system that automates the process of feature extraction. Feature extraction is one of the major aspect of connectionist modeling. It has been one of the most difficult areas for deploying neural networks to the masses. And deep learning is providing us with tools for automating this particular aspect. I'm showing you here also, I took it from certain type of images, major type of neural networks that have been proposed in uh, the literature. And uh, it, they have been uh, provided by a number of research. So this is the uh, uh, residual network, which is known as uh, DresNet. And uh, it was uh, discovered by he in 2015. Uh, then there is the Google Net uh, architecture by uh, Skejedi. And uh, there is also the 
feature visualization of Google Net trained on ImageNet system. So this illustrates, I mean, from the left-hand sides to the right-hand sides, how the system understands and how the system is able to filter uh, different type of patterns from the lowest level of the patterns, which are the edges, the texture, to the patterns, to the parts, to the objects themselves, to the classification components of the system. And each one of them here is part of the Google Net uh, components of the system in this particular model here. So this is the first part, this is the second part, this is the third part, this is the fourth part of the system. And for those who are interested in reading about the visual feature visualization of Google Net trained on the image net, uh, could go to this website, the Google Brain team, and go into the, uh, this particular website to uh, look at the excellent articles that have been proposed in this area. But that is not the subject of this presentation. So this I mean, the higher level that I would like to mention. So this, we say the large portion of what we refer today as AI successes are in fact, deep learning breakthroughs. Despite the fact that AI has benefited, I mean, as we mentioned, AI is a set of technologies. One of them are machine learning and deep learning. Deep learning has been one that has the uh, lion's share in terms of the breakthroughs that have been made in recent years, uh, whether in machine learning, whether in uh, computer vision, whether in uh, pattern discovery, whether in natural language processing, many of them have been in the area of deep learning and the advances that have been made in this particular regard. So uh, again, I mean, this picture, which I took it also from the Dataflash websites shows, I mean, the every area has benefited from this uh, huge growth of the usage of uh, deep learning systems, education, transportation, insurance, media, entertainment, healthcare, energy and utilities. And you see that a number of these uh, areas are strategic areas in the UAE here and um, a number of our faculty members here at uh, Mohammed bin Zayed University uh, of artificial intelligence are working in some of these particular areas and developing algorithms in these particular fields to benefit these particular uh, sector. So major benefits of the society, I mean, are unquestionable. So uh, society has benefited over the past several years, whether in the area of uh, uh, autonomous driving, whether in the area of machine learning, uh, whether in the area of autonomous uh, driving, whether in the area of manufacturing, whether in the area of supply chain management, in the area of healthcare system, uh, efficiency, productivity for small, medium, large businesses has increased for those companies that have known how to utilize the tools of operational AI systems. And we come uh, in few slides to show that this benefit has not been gener general because a number of companies were not able to capture the tools that they need for their particular industry because they did not have the capacity to customize the tools for their uh, usage for their particular usage in that particular company. Uh, these are some of the uh, projects that I have worked, I mean, with colleagues over the past students and colleagues over the past few years in the area of smart mobility systems in the connected vehicles, driverless autonomous cars, smart highways and uh, ADA systems. We have utilized the latest tools of uh, uh, operation artificial intelligence in the area of the design of smart cities, basically smart uh, hospital, uh, smart factories, uh, smart transportation systems within the context of the smart city model, the connected vehicle and the infrastructure. So we have developed, I mean, uh, several type of uh, configurations for developing and simulating uh, using uh, digital twin systems and uh, uh, high level simulators smart city systems using particular components. Each one of them is, uh, I mean, using the tools of uh, operation artificial intelligence. Uh, there is also the area of uh, virtual care system. There is the area of smart health, 
uh, usage. I mean, all of these has been uh, part of uh, some of my research work over the past few years in these various fields. So this is, I mean, a system where uh, you have an AI system for healthcare utilizing, I mean, uh, from the patient size to the sensory sites to the edge for cloud to the AI, for processing the information, for fusing the information, and then providing uh, a very reliable type of information, whether for an emergency vehicle or to the, phys to the physician or the family or to other type of uh, uh, I mean, utilities that could help the individual from uh, part one to the part, the, the, the latest notification. And this is one of the future aspects of uh, virtual healthcare care system. Uh, I, am, uh, I have published an article in, uh, uh, in the Wired magazine, and it will be published soon, I mean, on the website of the university, talking about the application of this particular system, AI for healthcare system, giving, uh, I mean, effective type of usage of a person who's living on his own uh, or her own in a particular environments and how notification system is being sent to the physician or to the family according to a certain type of hierarchical level of the notification emergency. So all of these are part of the operational AI system that we have done some work in it. Of course, the license plate recognition has been there for a number of years. It's one of the earliest that have benefited from deep learning. Traffic assessment is being utilized almost now in every uh, cosmopolitan cities that are using uh, traffic systems by means of artificial intelligence, fingerprint recognition that now we see it, I mean, for uh, getting, I mean, to your website on your smartphone and using, I mean, it is based on a deep learning type of model, a speech recognition, virtual assistant systems are based on a very powerful artificial intelligence uh, system that is using deep learning system. Uh, image recognition uh, diagnosis for a number of diseases has also benefited from all these operational AI. Even uh, whether to yield prediction for uh, predicting the outcome or predicting the yield for a particular uh, uh, sector of a farm has, uh, we have used here some of the latest tools of artificial intelligence and deep learning uh, as applied to that particular uh, sector. And for each one of those type of applications, we have utilized some of the tools that are uh, specifically oriented for that particular system. There is no uh, system that we could utilize for several other uh, tools. So this is good in itself because you can customize the application, but there is also a challenge which I'm going to come to uh, later on that differentiate this from the human being or the uh, artificial general intelligence where human could deal with multi type of functionalities at once and that we haven't seen yet systems that are doing these particular type of models. So other application of operational AI are in the computer vision system in the area of speech decision support system. And these tools have been applied over the past few years. I mean, uh, with a huge increase in terms of accuracy that has never been seen over the past 40 years. So when you see image, uh, I mean, speech recognition, I mean, going every year from 1970s to the 1995 to the 2000s, every year you get, I mean, a jump of 1% to 2% improvement in accuracy. And then you see a jump from 2005 to 2010 with almost 30% of increase within five years that's a revolution, I mean, in terms of signal recognition, especially in the field of speech recognition using tools of deep learning uh, models. So, of course, all these type of technologies are, uh, I mean, being helped with what we call enabling technologies. Without these enabling technologies, operational AI cannot be implemented. These are type of sensory systems that are now uh, in uh, Internet of Things systems. I mean, that are measuring humidity, that are measuring the pluviometry, that are measuring the temperature of a human being, that are, I mean, ev almost everywhere. And these type of tools, I mean, they are the enabling technologies to make use to surround the human or to surround the machine with capabilities which itself make use 
of machine learning and artificial intelligence type of systems. Uh, data fusion is another uh, uh, technologies, enabling technologies that have provided a lot of uh, support to make reliable estimates of particular type of sensory systems, whether for a vehicle or for human, uh, for humans for uh, generating a certain type of decision system using the tools of AI. How to build capacity in the field of operational AI? This is a problem that has confronted a number of companies. I have been interacting with industry for almost 30 years now. And always, I mean, the problem, they come up with a particular problem. They tell you that we are not able to, to do this. We try to borrow this particular algorithm, but we're not able to implement it. And this applies to the tools of AI. A number of companies, they feel that there is the AI system or operation AI algorithm out there. They try to use it and they try to implement it, but they are not successful in implementing it. So these type of companies, this type of industry require what is known as building capacity. How to do that? So this is, I mean, uh, uh, something that when I uh, talk with the industrial people, what, what I uh, suggest to them what to do. So basically, each company has to anticipate the trend in that particular industry and then acquire the resources early on before the competition sets on on a particular system. So companies that have acquired the know-how in artificial intelligence in deep learning five, six years ago have certainly an advantage now over companies that are starting now to acquire these type of resources. Build AI machine learning clusters with expertise in core areas of the business. So you have to focus on the usage of artificial intelligence for utilizing the operational aspect of it for that particular type of business. There is no thing that is, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, AI for every type of industry. Every type of industry require a certain set of algorithms and a certain set of usage for that particular system. Build data storage capabilities and just analytically relevant data. So if you are able to have storage systems in your own industry or in your own company, try to do that as long as it is not expensive enough and it has a certain type of return on investments. Increase business leaders' knowledge. So this is here I'm talking about people who are the head of their company. So these people have to be aware of the latest type of technologies in AI. People at the same time in the government, the leaders of the governments. And uh, this is basically where the executive program that is being launched in the next few days by Mohammed bin Zayed University uh, is coming to, the, uh, to support this particular aspect, increase business and government leaders' knowledge of advanced analytics. So university, our university is contributing to this particular aspect because it's of a great importance. Build a high performing team in the field of AI machine learning. So this is difficult to achieve because nowadays to find expert in these fields it's a little bit challenging. And that's why our university is trying to form and to mentor our next generation of experts in this particular field that could shine on the usage of the industry regionally, locally, and internationally. Of course, embed early on data and analytics in transformational and strategic initiatives. So this goes with all the other type of goal in order to have a strategic view of how you are trying to improve things and how you are trying to increase the capabilities of that particular company. The governments, public and private institutions have to invest now and big, so continue investing. There are a lot of governments now, there are a lot of institutions that are investing big in the educating the masses and corporations on the benefits of AI and machine learning. Our university here has been created for this particular goal, to, uh, to mentor leaders, to create, I mean, this know-how, to create this knowledge, this expertise, to make it useful for the rest of the society and for the rest of the companies. Massively train students and professionals on the state of the art tools of AI and machine learning. So this is a major goal of institutions such as our, uh, ourselves here in training uh, the next generation of leaders in these particular fields. Tight cooperation involving industry and research institution is of paramount importance and I'm going to speak about it in few slides. 
initiate workshops, seminars, similar to what we are doing here at our university at various industries and businesses to educate employees on benefits of AI and to form next generation of leaders. So we have our professors, our faculty members, our researchers that are cooperating with companies that are teaching the know-how to these people that are possibly never heard of AI or possibly heard about it, but for them, it's something vague. For them, it's something that they might not use, be used by their uh, respective industry. And this is an important thing that we ought to do here. Uh, favorable environments uh, for businesses and the industries. I mean, there has never been a fa more favorable environment than now because of the easy access to huge computational resources, easy access to a repository of a huge amount of data, whether text, whether it's speech, whether it's images. Uh, public libraries are, I mean, all over that you can utilize. But this also confuses people. So we need to know and we need to customize the need of a particular society, of a particular uh, industry or a particular business for this particular usage. And that's why they have to strive to hire the right leaders who would dedicate, uh, who, would, uh, who would like to direct them on what to use, when to use it, and how to have accessibility to these particular type of know-how, uh, I mean, that are coming outside of the universities or they are in research institutions. So this is the role of the university industry in promoting operational AI. And this is very, very important. So there is the university there, there is the government there, and then there are the industrial partners. The university, the government, and the industrial partners have, I mean, traditionally provided a lot of inputs to, to, to the society. So the university provides research lab, it provides research centers, uh, in their graduate, graduate program, industrial partners provide funding uh, in various areas, banking, healthcare, manufacturing, automotive, and of course the government provides, I mean, national research lab, government agencies, national, national data repositories. But in between, there has to be a linkage, there has to be a bridge. And the bridge could be an institute. It could be an AI institute. It could be an AI university similar to this university, uh, Mohammed bin Zayed University of AI, which is going to capture, I mean, funding from industrial partners, receive facilities from the governments for infrastructure, and also get, I mean, uh, inputs from uh, university and from academic type of environments, uh, whether here at the university or from the surrounding type of area. So I see the impact of the AI Institute, such as Mohammed bin Zayed University, as a linkage that connects between the industry, between the governments, and other players in the society. Operation AI challenges and risk. So, uh, of course, I mean, all of this comes with a challenge. And we know that larger businesses have generally benefited more from AI than smaller ones. And uh, if we can see it, I mean, th during the advance, advent of uh, the COVID-19, you could see that uh, uh, companies uh, that have benefited from AI have been uh, benefited, I mean, with the growth of almost 40 to 50 percent. So these giants have benefited, I mean, with an increase of market capital of almost 50 percent. And the smaller companies, either they haven't survived or the growth hasn't been as much. Of course, there are smaller companies, startup companies that have flourished and they have become giant in own, their own rights, but that is not the general case. So uh, operational AI has benefited mostly large businesses and uh, that's, that's unfortunate, but still larger businesses are benefiting the society in their own right, but that's what we are seeing as the spin up of this major revolution. AI is still in its infancy. We haven't reached yet the level of a human intelligence and artificial general intelligence is the ultimate goal, but is it a good thing? that we are going to spend a lot of research time, a lot of work to try to reach this particular level of something that uh, the mind is working similar to the human. I don't think so from my point of view, as long as we are able to mimic the human intelligence in terms of the actions and in terms of recognizing our environments and in terms of perception, that should be enough and uh, at, at, this, at this particular level. Deep learning algorithms, of course, have major issues. A lot of them are not transparent. 
they lack explainability. Uh, and this is a problem for certain application, especially in the healthcare system. A number of people in the healthcare system avoid using deep learning algorithms because, I mean, these systems are not able to explain the output of a certain type of system, even if you train perfectly, even if the accuracy of the system reached 99%, 98%, sometimes they will tell you, the, oh, no, this is not enough, or I can, I'm not able to explain this particular type of outputs. And that's what I visualized earlier, the feature visualization of the effects of particular type of features on the output of the system is a major area of uh, interest by a number of researchers from around the world. And this is a big problem. The explainability of uh, deep learning system is one uh, aspect that has remained challenge. Major issues concerning trust in AI, fairness and bias in machine learning. So this is also an area that a lot of people are giving a lot of attention uh, nowadays. I mean, in the area of ethics, in the area of trust in AI. So uh, there are a lot of issues and a lot of uh, stories for which the outcome has not beneficial. The issue of catastrophic forgetting in continual learning need to be resolved before sending systems as end products. Uh, myself and my students have published a number of articles in this particular area um, in the area of continual learning. What is continual learning? Continual learning is basically uh, designing the system that keeps accumulating learning on various type of tasks. Okay, and we would like to do it similar to how the human are doing because nowadays, uh, again, we don't want to mimic how the brain works, but we would like to mimic how the brain reasons and that's continual learning. So basically how to achieve a certain type of tasks, I mean, designing a neural network or a system that could learn on various type of tasks. As you know, deep learning systems have almost perfected the output for specific task of recognition, for specific task of image recognition, for speech recognition, for natural language understanding. But when you would like to accumulate capabilities for a machine learning system, it has become very, very difficult to do. A catastrophic forgetting for a particular type of task which you would like to merge within a particular structure of a system has been a major difficulty. Because every time you teach a neural network system on something, and then you would like to teach it on some other things that might be related to it or might overlap to it, the system has tendency of forgetting what it has been taught. This is quite different from human that it could accumulate knowledge. I mean, as we uh, train our, our system, there are a number of, uh, I mean, uh, solutions that have been presented and uh, some of it, I mean, uh, uh, merges uh, semi-supervised learning uh, models, architecture with other type of architecture uh, of reinforcement type of learning. One of the very, very recent type of article, I mean, by DeepMind in this particular area is worth uh, reading. And I'm going to mention this uh, because it's a very recent article and it's worth looking at uh, because it provides a number of insights on whether people are able to reach the general intelligence. So more powerful algorithms that are transparent and explainable implemented on adequate architecture and integrated with other tools of AI could get us closer to achieve more powerful operational AI. So not one single net neural network, not one single system. So it has to be a cooperation of multi-agent type of system. Each one of them with particular type of capabilities could get us closer to achieve powerful operational AI system, especially for um, difficult system to operate or for difficult system to navigate, some similar to autonomous type of vehicle system, which has many type of uh, sensory models that have to be fused, that have to receive information in real time, and it requires several type of uh, combined neural integrated neural network or intelligent systems that have to cooperate with each other. AI agent based on deep reinforcement learning system, this is the article that I mentioned to you, claims to be a step forward to artificial general intelligence. So this was uh, published only a few, few days ago or a few weeks ago, if I remember, and it was some of the most recent research work by the DeepMind uh, group. We are still in the infancy stage with regards to major opportunities offered to us. 
uh, challenges confronting us ahead of a clean, ethical, and unlimited power, powerful tools. I mean, this is, I mean, something that we need to uh, to, to to achieve uh, for designing uh, operational uh, AI uh, system that could help us out and could surmount many of the challenges ahead. So there are a lot of promises, but there are also a number of challenges that, I mean, uh, motivate us to do research, but at the same time, we would like to be close to the, I mean, to the industry in question or to the businesses in question who might provide us with data, who might provide us with a number of things to help us out understand the various type of uh, tools. Some of the publication that uh, I mean uh, made uh, for these uh, work that I have shown here, and these are some of my colleagues who have with whom I have worked in uh, recent year and with whom I am working also uh, here, and. Uh, I would like to thank you for uh, your, uh, I mean, for listening to this uh, talk, and uh, I will be happy to answer some of your question uh, as we proceed forward. So let me look at some of the question and answers that have uh, received here. So it says, thank you for the information about AI. Here, my question is, in the poor country, get into AI. Uh, yes, yes. I mean, there are a number of countries that are strategic enough. Uh, some of them are even in uh, uh, Africa. I mean, a few years ago, they haven't have access to AI systems or to machine learning. And now they are some of the most uh, people that are utilizing the tools of artificial intelligence in agriculture. One of the best examples is uh, Rwanda is using, I mean, uh, tools of AI for some of its uh, major farms of its uh, agriculture, where they are collecting various type of uh, uh, temperature, uh, humidity in a particular farm and whether to plant today or plant tomorrow or plant next week. And uh, they are also able to uh, predict the yield for a certain type of crop. So Rwanda has been, I mean, is not an extremely rich country, but it's a country that uh, we call, I mean, a country with uh, modest type of means, and they are using the tools of AI. This is only a small example. So uh, libraries are available to us. AI libraries are available to us. So as long as we are teaching these type of tools and we have to relate them to a particular type of industry and to relate them in our teaching curriculum with application type of context, I think, countries from all over the world could benefit from that particular experience. Uh, thank you so uh, for comprehensive. My question is the part uh, concerning energy. So let me see here what uh, I don't understand. So it says my question is in the part concerning energy. Yes, of course, uh, smart grid now and uh, is, I mean, a major uh, area and it is utilizing the tools of artificial intelligence where you have a smart grid composed of solar energy power system of uh, turbine, uh, I mean, that are powered with nuclear uh, plant or uh, with hydraulic type of uh, power system. And you try to combine the best possible type of combination using data that you have gathered over the years from all these type of power plants and how to release this particular energy to one part of the country versus another part of the country. So smart grid has been uh, very useful and very uh, has benefited a lot from uh, tools of AI. Uh, this one is from Marwan. Does MBZ AI University accept and welcome new ideas for implementing new sources of energy? Uh, yes, of course. Please communicate with some of our faculty members of our researchers. Simply email them. I mean, their email is available and uh, you should be able to communicate with them. Uh, thanks for this nice and comprehensive talk on operational AI. A fundamental AI is a fast growing research topic and new models application are coming out every day. So which ideal interaction between operational AI and fundamental AI? I mean, they have been interacting. A lot of people are utilizing fundamental AI. Fundamental AI, I mean, it's basically the art of developing algorithms for particular type of application using particular type of uh, mathematical tools for that particular application. And if you are able to suit that algorithm 
that particular structure of the neural network or deep neural network for a system that makes use of that particular architecture, then, I mean, you can marry both of them very, very conveniently. So uh, the type of neural network that I mentioned to you, the Google Nets, the ResNet, I mean, these are specific type of tools that have been used for particular application. One of them has been utilized for uh, large repository of uh, image recognition for images that are correlated to each other, possibly images that have been take, uh, taken into sequences. So there are a lot of possibilities for merging fundamental AI. Fundamental AI is very important. Every day we discover type of algorithms. But this being said, we need to make sure that these algorithms are useful at the end of the day. So these type of algorithm could be utilized for particular type of usage. So that's, yeah, basically the, what I have here. And let me check uh, another question. Great talk, Professor. With regard to challenges in Operation AI, how to overcome the issue of data scarcity? Of course, data scarcity is a big problem. And uh, when you don't have enough data for a particular type of system, it's, it's a little, uh, it's, it's a quite a bit of issue. And that's why a number of people try to avoid the, I mean, the systems based on deep learning because they are a system hungry for type of data system. So, uh, and a lot of people are trained to marry uh, tools of deep learning system with uh, recent type of tools of uh, other type of statistical learning models or other type of uh, tools of uh, AI. So uh, to, to, to deal with the data scarcity. So that's one particular side. For a number of applications, nowadays, people are doing the following. They are using giant simulators. They are using what is known as digital twins. So for a dynamic systems that you might not uh, have it as a prototype to run. So let's suppose that you are uh, running a simulation for, or you would like to have to collect data for a Hyperloop vehicle system. There are not a lot of Hyperloop, I mean, around the world. There are some prototypes, but they are very, very expensive to construct. So what people are doing nowadays, they construct what is known as digital twins. Digital twins, they are system that has almost the perfect replica of the dynamic of that particular model. And once they do that, then they can simulate the input to that particular model, and then they collect data under certain type of behavior for that particular hyperloop environment or hyperloop vehicle system. So this type of way, you are able to collect type of data. And they are doing it for autonomous vehicle systems at various uh, research center around the world. So data scarcity can be tackled, but it's a challenge a lot of the times, especially when the data is not clean, when the data is not labeled. So you have to do quite a bit of work. And that's why deep learning for a large repository system of data that is not ready to be implemented for a system is a challenge. And uh, companies spending a lot of time to uh, deal with them and to tackle this particular type of aspects. So that's basically what I have here. Thank you, sir, for amazing presentation. AI is really a very large field, but how can a youngster venture into artificial intelligence? Where do I need to focus on? Uh, yes, AI now, I mean, has come from very, very sophisticated, uh, highest level of computer science, computer engineering type of system to systems that are, uh, we are dealing in everyday life. So you don't need to be the greatest programmer in the world. So what you can do, uh, there are a lot of systems which are, which have built in algorithms and you could interact with them I mean, easily, of course, you have to have certain type of knowledge of certain type of programming uh, languages, but you could nowadays, I mean, access uh, the websites and then start uh, to create a little game with very, very little type of, uh, uh, I mean, little type of models that you can build uh, from these particular type of uh, programming language, language which are uh, visually oriented type of system. So a lot of people are uh, trying to do that. And I am uh, familiar at least with a few people who have made, I mean, uh, quite a bit 
uh, of, uh, of money by uh, creating certain type of game and they did not know anything about AI. They haven't studied AI. So they are high school students and then they went to first year, second year of, of engineering and they created, I mean, uh, I mean, a game using tools of AI and they have learned it, I mean, from the internet and they have learned it from, I mean, um, from people, from possibly uh, mentors. So it's not impossible to uh, learn AI. AI now is accessible, you can look at it, but uh, don't venture into the algorithm themselves at the start, because these, I mean, require a lot of knowledge, a lot of mathematical background. But AI now is, I mean, available. I mean, we are interacting with our mobile phone with the virtual assistant system, which is utilizing the latest type of technology in the form of speech recognition system, which goes to the cloud and then it comes back to us with the recognition type of um, query. So we are dealing with AI on every day, but we can also uh, create AI type of system. Okay, so uh, that's uh, what I have here in terms of question and answer. So I would like uh, to thank you very much for attending uh, this presentation and feel free to email me or to feel free to interact with our faculty members they should be very, very helpful to you and they should orient you if you have interest in a particular type of fields. So thank you again and uh, uh, we'll uh, meet with you in the future uh, online or through other type of mediums.